I've written a book which is called Adventures of a 21st Century Dowser. 21st century bit is important because lots of people think that dowsing uh, came to a dead stop in about the 1900s or whatever, but it doesn't, it goes on and on. So that's the 21st century bit. And um, my main interest is in archaeological dowsing and water divining. And I started off, how I started off I'm not going to say because that's in the book. Um, and so anybody that reads it will find out. But uh, I started off purely by chance, as most people do, and I began by getting involved with archaeologists because I wanted to find out whether what I could actually do was real or was it just me going potty. So uh, I decided after a while that it wasn't me going potty, uh, it was something that was going on between my ears and all the rest of it and um, I started to sort of get reasonably good at it. Um, most archaeologists who I started to deal with sort of regarded me with horror and sort of all headed into one corner away from me. But after a little while they got to know me and they got to realise that maybe I could solve, save them a little bit of digging, which uh, they all hated to do. So if I could point them in the right direction and they were lucky and they hit something, well all of a sudden, you know, I was the best thing since sliced bread. Now, this operates for amateur archaeologists. Uh, professional archaeologists uh, tend to work on the basis that, yes, we know it works, but um, we don't tell anybody else that it works. So there's a, like a secret, sort of secret society there. The peer pressure says dowsing doesn't work, but a lot of them know it does. And I know that they know it does because I've dealt with them. So when I was getting involved with archaeology, I suddenly realised that wherever we were going, we were dealing with human relations, buildings and all the rest of it, and we all needed water to drink. So therefore, I started to look for aspects of water on these sites. And Gradually, I became more involved in the water side because it fascinated me more. Um, and although I still work with archaeologists now, um, 30 years ago when I started, it was archaeology. The last 15 to 20 years, I've been involved with water divining, and now I get actually get paid to find water for people. But it's more complicated now than it ever used to be. So I'm just going to. I've got some samples here because my adventures in my book are when I started off very early on and I made all sorts of terrible mistakes which if you read the book you'll find quite amusing but they weren't at the time but looking back you know we all learn from our mistakes and believe you me I made mistakes so anyway they're quite enjoyable from that point of view but the original thought that most people have with regard to dowsing is that it's all to do with water and I've got here uh, a photograph of um, a pipe that somebody needed to find uh, on the canal in the West Country and um, they'd looked for this pipe for some time couldn't find it and they asked me if I'd go along and help them and uh, it worked out that I had to go down about five feet mentally five feet uh, to hit this pipe and this is one of the best things, that, well the quickest, um, the quickest reasons that this has worked out for me was that two hours later they dug the hole and found the pipe. And I've never known anything go as quick as that before. Usually it's years before something actually happens and you can actually get proof that what you said is there, is there. <coughs> so this is, this is the standard version of dowsing that most people know of, looking for water, looking for water pipes, that sort of thing. But these days, it's become more complicated because we now live in a world where, in this country, our water supply is very, very sophisticated. We all turn the tap on and there comes the water. If you live in the southeast of England and you've got a farm, you can't go and put in a borehole anywhere now because there's a moratorium on them. Um, we're full up with the boreholes and there's, there's far too many boreholes and we're running short of water, as in the southeast of England and in East Anglia. So 
the days when I could go out to a farm and look for water for somebody and hopefully find it, uh, for me, are long gone. But in other parts of the country it still goes on. But in many respects I don't mind because when I was finding water for farmers or golf courses, that sort of thing, um, I was risking I was risking people's money up to up to a tune of about ten or fifteen thousand pounds, and it was all based on what I was saying or the feedback that I was getting from my dowsing rods or my my fork stick that I used. So I'm less worried about finding smaller things now than somebody having to spend about ten or fifteen thousand pounds, and I could be wrong. Um, but as I always say to everybody. It's your risk. If you want to accept what I'm doing, then that's your risk. But I'll do the best I can. But dowsing is an art, not a science, and therefore you have to make allowances. So that's that's the basic thing. Now this picture is not very clear, but this is somebody's basement, and you can see some steps at the far end. Okay, and it's running with water, uh, and in fact. Uh, they have a colony of little green frogs that live in it because it's, it's a regular water supply and if you walk through that passageway the water is about an eighth of an inch deep and it's continually running and the problem that I had was to find out where the water was coming from and I had to go all around the house to try and find it and to this day I still don't know where the water comes from it's just one of those things that you try your best but it still goes wrong and you have to uh, hold your hand up to the fact that now and again you can't get the right answer, it can go wrong and you just have to accept it as that. The good news about this is that because all the brickwork on the base basement was wet, because I was there doing what I was doing and trying to find out how they could stop the water from coming through into the basement, they were thinking about hoping to dry the basement out but the architects and all the surveyors said that the best thing for, it, for things to do is for the water to keep running because if the brickwork dried out it would crumble <coughs> and the whole house would collapse into the basement so um, there we go maybe I've sold, saved them some money I don't know so here we go into this is near the Oval in London this is a, a private uh, a private housing complex and um, you can see there's a lot of gravel here. They've got a big gravel area in the middle of the, of the square where they play ball and all that sort of thing. Um, but the gravel was filling up the, with the drains and then the drains were getting flogged and then everything was flooded. Now when I got there apparently uh, Thames Water had spent three months digging a big hole right at the end of the road find out where the problem was. They couldn't find it so after three months they filled it back in. But the reason that they couldn't find it was because the problem wasn't where they thought it was. The problem was not at one end of the square, it was to both sides of the square. And I had to find out all the little pipes that ran from the drains and they ran out to the sides of the square. They didn't all run down to, to the end. So these are the these are the things that you have to come come up against and every single every single job is different so you have to set your mind blank every time and start from scratch so that's that's the sort of thing that we get involved in these days now you might be surprised to know that this is a this is a large football ground as you can see uh, where they were losing something like 30 gallons an hour when they were putting putting the, um, the the boiler on. Now many of you may not know but most football grounds, especially these professional ones, have pop-up sprinklers on the pitch and they're often used before a game starts and at half time when the players go off the pop-up sprinklers go off and it starts spraying water everywhere. Now this stadium was built round about 1985 so it's quite modern but when I went there to try and solve the problem what they said to me is we don't know where the pipes are and I thought well hang on a minute it was only built in 1985 it's not like it was 200 years ago and they don't know where the pipes are 
So my first problem, apart from finding this leak, was to try and find out where the pipes ran. So football grounds are pretty big, as you can probably imagine. So I spent about two hours tracing all the pipes from the boiler house across the great big area of hard standing which the, which the supporters walked around and then trying, trying to follow it onto the pitch. Um, there was also a second problem, uh, again with the sprinkler system on the far side, but they'd more or less sorted that out. What amazes me is when I go on these jobs, how often people don't know where their pipes are. And I mean, we're talking about big professional organisations. <coughs> And it absolutely amazes me that they don't know where these things are because it's not like it's a long time ago, it's quite recent. Um, and it's amazing how, how often this happens. So anyway, having got there and done my bit of work, they then had to dig a great big hole. Um, as you can see in the corner of each, of each stand, there's an opening. And in one of the openings, this is where all the heavy trucks go through so they can handle the, the lighting and put great big cherry pickers up and that sort of thing. Um, and it was in that area, that bit of hard standing, where all the trucks came through, where all the breakage seemed to appear. So they had to dig a big hole. And quite unusually, because in 1985, people were using polypropylene, plastic type piping, rather than the old fashioned brittle stuff. But it was quite amazing that even there, this had actually fractured just due to the noise and the racket of trucks going in and out of that one yeah, section. The job is different. This is an industrial site, okay? And the Industrial Revolution started, what, about 1850 uh, onwards? And on this particular site, there's been three different lots of industry taking place, and every single Every single industry has brought in its own pipe work, its own cables, its own whatever, its own drainage system. And then they've gone, the place has been abandoned, somebody else has come in and so on. These people were putting in a new structure here, as you can see, and all of a sudden it kept filling up with water. Uh, and when I went to see this site, they said, well, do you know where the water's coming from? So I had to go and try and find it. This is a 70-acre site. This is just part of it. So I had to sort of walk all round and I found a great big pipe down here, this side of the this side of the, the ground. And they said, Oh, we haven't got that on our CAD system. Perhaps that's something to do with it. So I followed the pipe and it wandered off away from this. Eventually it found a ditch, and when I looked down the ditch, the pipe was sticking out into the ditch and there was a little trickle of water coming out, but it was nothing to do with this. So after going round a few more times, I suddenly realised that what had happened was they'd broken into an underground spring. Um, and then when I said to them, we've hit an underground spring, then they said, ah, that's interesting because the water always starts off clear. They didn't tell me that before, which could have helped me a little bit, but there we go. Uh, in many respects, I like to not know anything because that means that I've got a nice clear head and uh, it's not not confused with other things. So uh, in this particular instance they'd gone into and broken into a big spring under the ground uh, and once they got that sorted out the next thing they said to me was do you know how much water is coming through? So this is an interesting point. <laughs> so I had to try and douse how many gallons of water were going through and then I had to try and douse how many gallons of water were going through at different times of the year because they wanted to put a pump in. And if they put a pump in which was only going to take out 50 gallons an hour, for example, and in actual fact at some times of the year 70 gallons an hour was going to come through, it was all going to flood again. So they wanted to know exactly how, what was the worst possible scenario where the maximum amount of water would be coming through and I had to mentally go forward a year uh, in three monthly increments to work out where where the water was going to be gushing through at its at its strongest. Uh, and this this crops up quite a lot. It's quite amazing because the water over the course of 12 months, in actual fact, uh, the flow rate can vary quite dramatically. 
Um, so you always have to be a bit aware of that in, when you're when you're working these things out. So that's these are some of the things that we do now. So the old-fashioned version of the man walking across a field with a fork stick, and I've got a fork stick. I haven't got it here tonight with a fork stick. The man that walks across the field with a fork stick and a silly hat on. Uh, he uh, he's more or less consigned to history now, but it's got far far more technical in what you have to do and how you have to go about it. But you're still using this thing up here because this is where all the information comes from. This is nature's world wide web, if you like. So um, was it Tim can't, Tim Berners Lee? Tim Berners Lee when he conjured up the name of the World Wide Web and, and started it all off, which is quite clever, all very good, but nature has had the World Wide Web uh, for thousands of years. We just have to learn how to tap into it because everybody that's got a head on their shoulders has got access to the World Wide Web. It's just a question of how you tap into it or how you want to tap into it. Now, it always fascinates me and that's why I do what I do. So, having said all that, three weeks ago, because I do work for archaeologists, is an interesting aspect of, of dowsing. This, I was working in a trench three weeks ago, and I found this horseshoe, okay? Which is a quite a small horse, but it's a horseshoe. And one of the people on the site said to me, can you tell me how old it is? Now, when you think about it, if you want to know how old something is, this is not something that nature has created, so that it's something that we as human beings have created, so we can put a timeline onto the past. So we've got our different centuries, we've got our different periods of time, we've got our... We've got our Bronze Age, we've got our Iron Age, but they're not natural things. They're man-made. They're man-made things that we put on top of everything. So the question is, how on earth? Bearing in mind this is man-made thing, and I'm using I'm using a man-made system trying to find out how on earth do I tap into getting a date for for what when this is made or when this was made. So. Because they trust me, and I'm very relieved that they do, um, what I had to do there and then was to just try and douse the date. So I have no idea, my knowledge of history of horseshoes is zero. Okay? So I have to start off and I just have to ask a basic question about this horseshoe. And the question is, uh, was it made before the year 1600? You see? Now that is swinging out. Now that is my no. Okay. So this horseshoe was made after 1600. So I'm going to go up to the sixth. I'm in fact I'm going to start at 16th century. So just checking if it was made in the 16th century, 17th century. Now it's starting to swing in a bit now, as you can see. 18th century. Now it's 18th century. It swung across my chest, which means that somewhere in that time period. Uh, it was made. So I go back to 1700 and at seven, I start going up in five, 1705, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. So at 1735 was when this horseshoe was made. Now this in actual fact fitted in with all the other bits and pieces that were also found in the trench. But at the time it just helped to guarantee that they, they'd got all the details right from their bits of pottery and everything. But the question is, how on earth, because this is a man-made thing that you put onto things, how on earth do you work out that this was made in whenever it was? I mean, it, it's, it makes you ponder, doesn't it? You see, it's, it's, it's very profound, some of this stuff, which is why scientists don't really like it, because it bothers them. Now, to me, they accept the words. But in actual fact, again, to, uh, to their fellow scientists, um, 
it's uh, it's a bit of a taboo subject. They will say to me, yeah, yeah, I know it works. I mean, I've sold dowsing rods to scientists and I've got them using them you know, with me privately, but you won't see them anywhere else. But they know that these things work. But when they have to do a write-up about it, which they've done on me, what happens is that they put in a scientific explanation for something that's going on. So, for example, you all have, and we all have, um, uh, an idiomatic um, reflex in our arms. Um, and it's one of those things where suddenly if you're feeling a bit drowsy and you're just about to drop off and all of a sudden you go like that, that's an idiomatic reflex. Now, that is supposed to be what happens to me when I'm dowsing. Well, I mean, that's rubbish. I mean, how can that, how can I work out by my, how can my idiomatic reflex work out the date when that horseshoe was made? You see, it just doesn't make any sort of sense. But they have to go that way because it's the only way that their peers will accept the fact that uh, dowsing is, is all to do with chance and, and idiomatic reflexes. Got nothing to do with this at all because it worries them no end. Because if they had to agree that was something up here was doing this, then science would be turned upside down. And they don't like that, do they? The other problem, of course, is that you can't repeat exactly a, a scientific test with dowsing. Because if I'm dowsing for water, and I'm finding water at 200 feet, for example, um, if somebody says to me, can you go back to where we were just now and try it again? So I go back and if I douse it again, I will get a different answer. Now, the reason for that, I don't know. But the first time I do the douse is the correct one. After that, it, it goes wrong a little bit, one way or the other. Now, science likes to repeat these things so that they've got some sort of format, but you can't do it. Um, there is something in, in involved in dowsing which says you do it, you do it to your best of, of ability, you get it right the first time, you don't have to go back again because it's right the first time. If you want to go back another time and do it, well that's alright, more for you, what we're going to do, we're going to muck about a little bit, we're going to give you a different depth, you see. Because basically, uh, I'm, only the, I'm only the monkey, the organ grinders elsewhere and the organ grinder decides that you know you shouldn't you shouldn't mess about if you got it right the first time there's absolutely no need to go back and check it out again so that's that's basically what i think of, of dowsing and how i think most of it works anyway so how are we doing for time right um i've just been to france on a little job it's quite interesting um, well, I hope it's all interesting. Uh, I've just been to France on this little job, which was to go around a chateau to look for a tunnel. But that's quite a boring bit, really, because whilst I was in this little medieval village, there was a great big church in the middle of it. And uh, when I go into a church, the first thing I look for is a crypt. I've always done that, because very often people are not aware that there's a crypt. The second thing I do when I go into a church is to look for any other structures underneath the church because often a church is built on top of some other structure. Anyway, this place is enormous. This church is... Well, if there were 1,500 seats in the nave, I'd be underestimating the number of seats. It's absolutely enormous. But it's a tiny little village. It only has 90 people. It's only got no around it and a church in the middle. Uh, so I said to them, look, I think, whilst they were talking in French about something else, I was having a little wander around, and I said, look, I think you've got a night, you've got a, you've got a vault under, you've got a crypt here. So they said, no, 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 it's impossible. We've got the details of this church. It's built in 1215. We've got all the history. We've got all the details, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, I, I'm picking one up. So anyway, they were curious enough that the they said to me the next day, could we go back and we'll get pen and paper and tape measure and we'll measure it all out properly. 
So I said, yeah, that's fine, because when I was there, the temperature was about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and the church was the coolest place. So I was more than happy to work inside the church. So on the second occasion, I'm walking about in amongst all these chairs, because there's hundreds and hundreds of them, and I'm getting to a point where I've got a nice rectangle, and they're following along, and they're making little chalk marks on the floor, and then they're measuring it. So I've got my crypt, which is about 30 feet by 20. And what I then do is, obviously I've got a crypt. That space has got to be supported by something, because you've got to think things through as you're going along with all this. So it has to be supported by something. So I'm now looking for pillars. And I find three pillars in a row, but they're off centre, so therefore there must be another three pillars somewhere else. So I look round and I find another row of three pillars. Now when I'm doing the second row of three pillars, I don't know where I mark the first three pillars because there's a load of chairs in the way. Okay, so it's all blank. Anyway, having got the pillars sorted out, there's got to be some access point. So we look for the access point, and yes, we've got a nice access point coming down between two sets of pillars. Um, right, next thing is, how, de how deep is it? So I'm going down, and I'm going down to a depth of three feet, and suddenly I've, I've lost what I'm, whatever it is I'm on to, and I go down to 11 feet, and then I hit something else. So between three feet and 11 feet, I've got my crypt, which is about eight foot high, which is reasonable height. So after I've done all that, they come round with their piece of paper and they show me, and uh, although it's not scaled off, it all makes sense. The spacings of the up of the columns are right in that direction, and they're right in that direction. It all fits in. So they're getting quite interested now because this church is uh, in need of a certain amount of repair. As I say, there's only 80 people or 80 dwellings in this place. So that's that. Now. I come back to England and one of the blokes in the village, an engineer, finds that he's got a great big drill in his workshop and an angle grinder. So he has a word with a local mayor and they decide one evening to go down to the church when it's all quiet with a drill and the angle grinder and drill a few holes, you see, and this is in the church. So it's all, on, it's all being done on the QT. So anyway, the moment the drill starts, of course, it echoes round the church, and the whole place knows there's something going on. See? So within seconds, everybody's aware, and the secret is no longer valid. So he gets down, and he drills down, and he gets down to three feet, and suddenly, boom, there's, no, no, there's nothing, else, nothing there. So that's promising. So he goes across to another part, and he does the same thing again, and he goes down to three feet, and at three feet, boom, the drill starts to just drop through the floor. So they're even more excited now, especially the mayor, because he's got visions of opening this up and making lots of money to repair the fabric of the church. So that's that little bit. So two days later, the couple that I stay with out there phoned me up and said something interesting has happened. So the man who went to the church and did the drilling uh, uh, he was talking to uh, somebody about some business and he happened to mention the fact that he'd been drilling these holes in the church and thought there might have been a crypt there and this man said yes there is a crypt and this character said there can't be because we've got all the details this man who we was talking to came from the next department like we have counties in, in England they have departments came from the next department he wrote adventure stories and when he was writing his stories, he would actually go to the local archives, history places, and this, that, and the other, to get some background information. So when he was in the local department's main archive, he saw a reference to this church, and he thought, well, that's not right, because these details should be in the other department's area where the church is. So out of curiosity, he read it, and in it, it said, that in this church in Sarad, this is the name of the place, there is a crypt. And in the crypt are three consuls. Now, I think that they are high-ranking Catholic priests of some sort or another. 
Uh, but in the crypt there are three consuls. And of course, when the mayor discovered or heard this, he was bouncing off the walls with excitement because he was thinking of opening it all up and having glass cases and display stuff and raking lots of money to look after the fabric of the church. So, obviously, this is now August and uh, France goes away on, in August, doesn't it, pretty well completely. So, what's going to happen is, when everybody gets back from their holidays, uh, the people in Saran are going to go to the next department's archives and look it all up again and go through it all to see if it in actual fact does fit in with all the details. So that's the story as it is. But I mean, when you consider that all I'm doing is walking around with two bits of metal and using this and thinking, using my subconscious, and yet from all that, all these sorts of scenarios can open up. And I mean, I think it's fascinating. Um, and every time I go off on a job, I have no idea what's going to happen next. And I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the sheer beauty of doing what I do. So that's, that's the story so far. So whether Sir Ant has got a crypt or not, we don't know. But I hope it has, and the local mayor hopes it has. Um, and at that point, we will, we will leave it at there. So that's that's basically all i've got to say um if anybody has got any questions they'd like to put to me i'll be happy to answer them never is never is the lady who found the bones of richard the third okay um who was uh the secretary of the richard the third society was it something like that uh she found it by dowsing but she is, she is not allowed to mention the fact that she found it by dowsing. Uh, they, will keep her, they will keep her involved in what's been going on, so long as she doesn't mention the fact she found it by dowsing. The people who work with her, they say to you, if, you, if it was you, you say, I'm sorry, if you want to stay with us on the television, on the talks, then you don't mention the fact that you doused for it. So that's, that's what it is, it's a sort of a blanket ban on anything like that, because it embarrasses them. I'm surprised you say that, because I think, things, you know, I mean, I, I know another friend who downs this or whatever, he has a very, he doesn't feel, he doesn't carry this sense of mystery around him. They think it's really right. natural. Yes, well it is natural. Um, it is natural. Mm. And he is dealing with a lot of authorities. He doesn't have to cover anything up. Well, that's good. That's good. If I mean, I deal with authorities yeah. um, from time to time, and it's amazing what authorities I deal with. But it's still kept very much in a little compartment. You know, it's not so. Oh well, we use the dowser for this or whatever. It's still kept within a narrow little framework. You know. Oh well, I, I, I work for done lots of work with the National Trust, but I mean, um, you know, it, it's it's bizarre, but that's that's the way it is. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. In terms of when you're using it for archaeology, uh -huh. would you say you're picking up the structures, or are you picking up perhaps when you put a structure in, you get a water deposit around it? Because I mean, I I pick up energy fields, or I pick up water. Yeah. I haven't been aware of picking up structures. Well, I look for structures. You actually focus on my first the thing I go for. Uh, my my thing that I look for anything to do with I look for, and the the terminology is a man-made structure. Right. Okay. Because that covers anything. It could be right. a pipe or, or, or cable or something solid. Yeah. So that's what I home in on a man-made structure. When I found my man-made structure, if it's there. Then I try and sort out what it is. So I'm then looking for, for example, bricks. Right. So I go over that piece of ground again and I'm dowsing for bricks. Right. No bricks, don't get a reaction. Go right. back. So what else are we going to go for? Stone. So we go for stone. No reaction to stone. Let's go back again. Let's see flint and mortar. All, all the other building accoutrements that you use. So have we got flint and mortar? Vorm. Yes, we have. 
Yeah. Okay, so we've got flint and mortar. So that's how I operate. You can so only you do one question at a time. A question in the way you demonstrated there. Yes. Where you see you're not staying static and it's, you're actually going over the whole structure. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the other thing that I do, because I got caught out some years ago, I then have to stand over the structure and then I have to ask myself, am I standing over the structure? Okay, so then I, that confirms the facts. Okay? Uh, so the rods will cross to say that I'm standing over the structure. Now, the next thing I have to ask myself is this. Does that structure exist today? Okay? Because sometimes, and this is very, very strange, sometimes you pick up something that isn't there. Whatever. Uh, whatever it is, it could be somebody's proposed suggestion that something goes there. You could be picking up somebody's plan that somebody puts something down and they never get to it, and so on and so forth. But I've been caught two or three times like that, and in fact, um, to be honest with you, I have a large hole somewhere in Kent that I'm responsible for because I said there was a building here, uh, and after digging down about five feet. Uh, they suddenly realised that, sorry pal, but you got it wrong this time. There was absolutely nothing there at all. Um, and that's what you have to do. Always double check that the structure is actually there now. Because you can get caught out. And I, and I have in the past. And if I don't remember to do it now, I can still get caught out. Because sometimes I forget to do it. Yeah, yeah okay. Because you have to be... You know, you have to have, all the balls have to be in the air when you're dowsing. You, the, the moment you let one drop somewhere, you're going to get caught out. So um, you really have to have your wits about you. That's and the old maxim of uh, the only assumption you make in dowsing is never assume anything. Yes, that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I wonder if your dowsing rods are they specifically made and, and cleaned for that purpose, or can you just use any kind of gold? No, or? no. There's there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of sort of mystique around dowsing rods. This is the important bit, this thing between your ears, okay? If you can get that to work, if you can get your subconscious to work, then you're okay. Coat hangers work. Fine. Coat hangers, anything. Uh, this is, these are bits of welding rod. I mean, these are quite big and these are quite heavy because I work out of doors, so I don't want the wind to swing these round. If they're going to go, they're going to go, and the wind isn't going to make them go. So uh, that's what they're made out of. And when it comes to the wooden fork sticks, for example, people say, oh, it's got to be, um, oh, it's got to be something like apple wood, or it's got to be something like um, hazel. Um, it can be anything uh, that doesn't split because you're using it in a Y shape like that. And it has to be anything that doesn't split at that crutch point there when you just pull the things apart slightly. So if it's quite sturdy stuff, it can be anything. So there's a lot of mystique, but dowsing is very, very simple. You know, it's hard work when you do it, and after about two and a half hours, I've had enough, mentally. I feel my brain starting to go like that, and then I know that things are going to start to go wrong, so that's when I have to stop. Would you, would you use it, if you've got something specific in the house, would you use the <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I'm totally useless for that. <laughs> Absolutely useless. Every now and again, somebody will ask me if I can do something. I mean, I get all sorts of strange things happen. I, I had somebody phone me up the other week. Uh, they've lost their passport. Could I help them find it? I said, where are you? They said, we're in Cardiff. <laughs> well, I live in Kent. So, I mean, that's hell of a journey, isn't it, for a start. But... Um, I said to them, I'm sorry, but I'm no good at finding lost passports or, or anything else. I do try from time to time, but I, I, it's just something that I cannot handle. So I just stick to what I'm good at, and I let everybody else get on with all the other bits and pieces. Um, but some people have an ability, but not me. So I hold my hands up to that one. So when you dancing, apart from um, using the rods, I was wondering what other reaction would you get? Would it be like a body sensation or a visual or anything? No, like I don't. I don't get anything. Okay. 
I, I'm, I don't have any sort of sixth sense. You know, I, I can't walk into a room like some people can. Well, I can, uh, and, and feel that this doesn't feel right. I mean, I can do that in certain instances. But a lot of people are far more sensitive to that than, than I am. All I know is that when I'm using my dowsing rods, once I'm getting near to what I'm looking for, they'll start to move. Okay, so that's my that's my hint. <laughs> With the fork stick, because you hold it at about 45 degrees like that, and you hold it palms up, which, which is a very strange way of holding it. You think you'd hold it like that, but you hold it like that. Um, if I'm getting near to what I'm looking for, and the fork stick's quite dramatic, um, it actually starts to come towards me slightly, like just like a just like a snake about to pounce. Okay, it just comes up, and then boom, it's off, it's away. And you can't make it go that fast. If you tried to make it go that fast, you couldn't. It just goes, and that's it. Is there any advantage of using a fork stick over the rods? Uh, well, yeah, the the fork stick. I use both very often because one will one will sort of confirm the other. The when it comes to water, um, the fork stick for me is more sensitive, so I can get slightly better results. But I go over it with the rods first, and then I can use the fork stick. Okay, just just to sort of. Get, get some more extra feedback. But um, I, if I've got, if I'm using the fork stick, I'm attracted to water. So the fork stick will go down for water. But if I'm walking over a field and there's some archae archae archaeological remains under it, if I'm walking over the field with a fork stick, it will actually come up and hit me. Um, and the only other thing that it happens with. Um, the only other reason it, when it goes down is anything to do with the Bronze Age, it will also go down. I have no idea why, but that's what I've discovered over, over all the years that I've been doing it. But we're all different. You see. But the, the, the fork stick, water invariably, but sometimes if it's, if it's a structure, something man-made, it comes up, which is why you should never hold it right in front of you, because it will give you an arsy smack. <laughs> okay? So you always hold it to one side, so if it's going to come up, it's going to hit you on the shoulder rather than smack you in the nose. I, mean, I, know, I mean, I know that there are a lot of people uh, who douse who can't use the fork stick, right. which yeah. is rather strange to me, because you know, it was just so easy, it just sort of happened. So I can't understand why people have that problem, but they do. And you just had to accept it. Yeah. But yeah, down for water and anything to do with the Bronze Age, but you don't get Bronze Age very often. Uh, anything man made, bump, up it comes and it clobbers you on the shoulder. So that's that's how it works for me. Do you set the intention to look for something? Yes. Yes. Yeah. You start off looking for some man made structure and then you start, once you've found it, you want to try and find out what it is. Okay? how wide it is, how far down it is, how much of it is still left, when was it built, when did it fall into disrepair, and then don't get caught with that one because sometimes the building will fall into disrepair and be re-erected again, so you can carry on and find out if it's been rebuilt after it fell into disrepair, and so on and so forth. So you always have to have your wits about you. You mentioned lap dousing in the book at all, John? Yes. Yeah. In fact, there's quite an interesting bit in there, in with regard to, uh, with regard to when I went to Portugal, to um, map dousing. Um, there, there is one bit in the book. I haven't told the whole story of this one, but I was in Norfolk and a, a heifer had escaped out of a farm, and we'd spent me and about 25 farmers in Norfolk, because I was up there on holiday, spent about a day trying to find this heifer and it was galloping all over the place. It was going up onto the main road and stopping all the traffic. Uh, it was going through people's duck ponds causing all sorts of mayhem and you couldn't find the thing most of the time. All you could see was its paw prints in the, in the ground because it had been a heavy thunderstorm the night before and everything was soaking wet. So you could follow where it had gone, but you couldn't see it. Um, but anyway, a series of phone calls, and it was in actual fact found, 
the actual story of it, I'm not telling you, but uh, when they actually did find it in the end, the poor old thing it was so shattered that it was resting, of all places, um, in an orchard. Now it was the worst possible place to get this animal out because all the orchard trees were about, you know, the branches were about this high, so they couldn't get a horse box in anywhere near it. So they had to sort of go in with a big rope and try and catch it before it decided to go off and gallop off again. And they managed to get hold of it. And then they had to drag it out. It must have weighed about half a tonne. They had to drag it out of this orchard up to a horse box on the side of the road. Drag it into the horse box. And it's still kicking and screaming, apparently. But anyway, dragging it into this horse box. You know at the side of a horse box at the front, you lead the horse in from the back and then the back goes up, but there's a little side door at the front so that the, so that the groom can, can go out. Well, when this, when this animal saw the gap at the front where everybody was coming back out with their rope, he decided to follow them. And before they could shut the door, he was out again. So they had to start all over again. Anyway, it was, it's, uh, that's not in the, the story's in the book, but that little bit isn't. But it was, uh, it was an interesting experience, yeah. Any other questions? Do you just dance for physical things or do you do earth energies and things like that? Uh, I tend to leave that to other people. I like to work on the basis of am I any good? Am I getting better? Uh, can I prove what I'm doing is, you know, is what I'm doing provable? Because I do like proof. I always like to know if I've been successful. <coughs> and uh, if I've been unsuccessful, I also like to know that. because. Only by knowing that do I know roughly how well I'm doing. So, um, now the more, the more what I call the more esoteric stuff, like ley lines and that, all right, I can find them. But I like to concentrate on what I know can be sort of found at some point or other. Because that's what I enjoy, the, the thrill of the chase, okay? And knowing you've got it right, because that doesn't matter how simple a thing it is, if you've got it right, well, I mean, that's amazing. You know, I always think it's amazing anyway. It amazes me. Every time I get something right, I think, crack, how do I do that? Yeah. But there we go. That's me. See, going over a, I mean, if you're going over a seven-acre site, yeah. I would expect there to be energy lines as well. Do you exclusively focus? I'm not looking for energy focus? lines. You, you just exclusively focus on finding I'm water, just, so you don't or get whatever, any... Or whatever, yes. Right. I stand in one corner of a field, and the field boundary is my perimeter, my mental perimeter is the field boundary. I stand in one corner of the field and I have one dowsing rod and what I do is I just, I just stand in the corner and I'm, I'm just looking for a man-made structure within the area of this field because the question that you ask is most important. Okay? If you don't put your question right, you're going to get a wrong answer. So it's, I'm looking for a man-made structure within the confines of this field. And then I just go round like that. And if, for example, um, I find something, it will actually start to drag me back. Like that, for example. So uh, if, just using it as an example, I mean, I know Sandy is over there. If I want to try and find out where Sandy is, that will actually start to point around and it will point to her, okay? Now it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter where I turn, that will still keep pointing at her. Because that's what I'm, that's my target, that's what I'm fixed on. And it's as simple as that, once you've got the hang of it. John, when you, when you give that oval, what sort of questions do you have to ask? Because you have to change everything At the oval, yeah. well, there were drains down the middle of the. Yeah, and then you knew that one. Yeah, and then once I'd found the drains, I had to find out if all the drains linked up. Three of them did, the fourth one didn't. And then uh, where they were supposed to be, tipping out into a big, <coughs> big drain at the end where Thames Water had been spending three months, there was nothing there. So I had to go up the sides of the drains and then finding pipes that went off. So they went off sideways and they actually went into the road which went all the way around the oval, not down the middle, which is where Thames Water thought it were. So 
There you are. Follow the trail. Yeah. Last question, anybody? Can I ask, um, earlier on, when you found the horseshoe, you were surprised because it was a man-made object, but yet the man-made constructions doesn't surprise you. What's the differentiation between a man-made structure with, with um, bricks and so on and a man-made horseshoe? Um, how do you mean it surprised me? Um, I've lost the... I thought you was... you were... Um, not that I know. Not that I know. Of. No, I think you were saying about the dating. The dating. Uh, because it's to do with the dating. Um, but uh, it was just a, the thing that I. I mean, I just. I wasn't looking for a horseshoe at that time. I was just working in a trench, an archaeological trench. I was doing some troweling, and in actual fact, the horseshoe started to appear. So I wasn't looking for anything specific. I don't always douse when I'm in a trench or anything. I just do what everybody else does, which is... But the reason we're in the trench is because I picked the spot in the first place as being a likely place for something to be found. But I didn't take it any further than that. Okay? Right, I think we're all done. Yeah, so maybe right. we just thank John for a talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.